just as as a wrap up to the last question, so I'll just put this in here. Um, Jesse quoted this passage, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but wherever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. This passage can only be uh, interpreted properly in the context of, of Jesus' words. So, you know, in, in the interpretation of Scripture, there are three things that are important, context, context, and context. So who was Jesus speaking to in this? He was speaking to the disciples. And when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit did lead them into all truth, and they wrote it down on paper form, and we have it now as the New Testament, the source of truth for Christians. It is clear that the apostles were the divinely authorized agents through which the Holy Spirit proclaimed the final revelation of Jesus Christ. And so for me, every cult in the world uses this, that Christian cults use this, Holy Spirit, when it comes, can lie to you all truth. This is what we're doing. This is truth. You've got to believe us. Um, well, if it's outside of Scripture, I say no. Um, and and this is not, and because everybody, so I can say, oh, look, the Holy Spirit has led me out of the message. And Jesse will say, the Holy Spirit has led me into the message. This is not what we're talking about. I think this specific Scripture passage talks about, is Jesus speaking to the disciples? And the Holy Spirit did lead them into all truth, and they wrote it down, and that's what we have. So, anyways, that's... That's that. Um, well, I'm um, just briefly because I, I know that'll probably get lost in the response. I do still want to give you the the three minute response to to Jesse. So, so here's here's the follow up to Jesse's question. So so um, we didn't touch on one of the biggest lies that William Branham told, and that is of the cloud over Flagstaff on on February 28th, 1963. Um, the cloud appeared over Flagstaff, Arizona. William Branham never mentioned the cloud until after the picture appeared in Life magazine in May 1963. It was such a big deal. Why no mention of the cloud until three months after the fact? And, and this is more of what I believe is an after-the-fact attempt at deception. In June um, of 1963, William Branham said this, and there, right under it, I was standing. That was a lie. In August, William Branham said, there was that white circle above me there circling around. He said, I didn't know it, but cameras from all over the country was taking the picture of that as the white cloud settled down and went on the Associated Press. That was simply a falsehood. In April 1965, he said this, that day they took pictures all across southern United States and Mexico. And then he said, and at the same time, a great cluster of light left where I was standing and moved 30 miles high in the air around the circle like the wings of an angel and draw it into the skies a shape of a pyramid in the same constellation of angels that appeared. Science took the picture. Simply not true. He wasn't there. Rebecca Smith, um, who I knew well, uh, wrote an article in believe the uh, uh, the the only believe magazine uh, that said that um, you know outlined all of the uh, events surrounding it. So how could someone that did not tell the truth on such a clear matter be the messenger to the Church of Laodicea? He lied about it. And for your Pastor Smith, yeah, as far as the cloud, I don't believe he lied about it, Rod. I just believe maybe he got his dates mixed up. I have uh, four points about the cloud. How many? I have five minutes, Brother Jay, or three? Um, I think we're going with the three minutes right now. It kind of depends on if you – no, actually, we'll, we're going to keep it with the three minutes because I just recall, actually, the re the reason we even said that Rod could uh, articulate the thought again in the first place is because it was supposed to be his final thought. So I guess we wouldn't want to necessarily get bogged down in that again. So, yeah, let's just go with the three minutes responding about the cloud. Okay, yes. First of all, um, my first point is this case is ultimately uh, their word against Brother Branham's word. Uh, they cannot fully prove with absolute certainty the cloud was formed by a rocket. They can make their data and paperwork an absolute, but that doesn't mean it is. Uh, nor can I prove it was formed by seven angels. But I'm just taking Brother Branham at his word because of his Bible-based teaching. The second point is Brother Branham never said, he never said, thus saith the Lord, I was under the cloud when the photo was taken. So that means this wasn't uh, a prophecy, and we can't jump to a conclusion and make every word he said about the cloud, thus saith the Lord. Again, he could have got the dates confused. He might have been there later in March. Um, 
obviously not there February 28th. Obviously, I don't, I don't think many people argue about that. Um, point three, though, the vision of the seven angels and its fulfillment was spoken in the name of the Lord. It was prophesied on December 30th, 1962, and again on January 14th, 1963. I've got the quotes here. Brother Ram says, I'm standing in awful place. Remember, I tell you in the name of the Lord, I've told you the truth, and something is fixing to happen. He called it a pyramid. He didn't call it a cloud, but he called it a pyramid of constellation of angels. Okay, and then that's what he called it a pyramid. A pyramid is a, a triangular shape, just like the picture was. And then in uh, Trump, it gives an uncertain sound. He said, I'm here in Phoenix tonight in the name of the Lord. And he goes on, explains what he said about the, uh, the vision in Sirs. Is this the, is this the time of it, Sirs? And then after he preaches the seven seal on March 24th, he tells us it was fulfilled. He said, now remember in the vision, he never told me one thing in the vision when he took me up. He said, he talks about going up in the vision. He said, so I could truly say to the best of my understanding, according to the word of God and the vision, the revelation, the interpretation thereof is thus saith the Lord. So Brother Ram talks about being taken up uh, and he talks about the vision being fulfilled there in the seventh seal. One minute. Okay. And then the last point that should work out. Okay. Now, I, the last point is Brother Branham could have been under the cloud on February 28th by translation. I'm sure, Rod, you've heard that before. Like Philip. Uh, like Philip was translated, but also like Ezekiel. Uh, in Ezekiel 8.15, Ezekiel was taken to Jerusalem in the visions of God in Ezekiel 8.15 while sitting in his house in Chaldea, probably a hundred more or miles away. According, that's to John Gill. I used John Gill's commentary on that to try to get about how far away was uh, Chabar. Okay, so Ezekiel's vision was not a translation like Philip because Ezekiel's body stayed in Chaldea. Philip's body was literally translated to another area like uh, Acts 8, 39 through 40. And I'll pause right. I'll stop right there. And, and I'll just leave that with one question. Great. If so, why didn't he mention it until three months later? He was lying. And then, Pastor Smith, you're going to have the uh, last word on that before we go to your third question. Okay, yeah, I, I don't believe Brother Brandon was lying. I believe he was telling the truth. Um, um, it's, those things could have happened. Uh, I, think it, I think, again, it's just Brother Bram's word against their word. But I do believe that was a fulfillment of Revelation 10, 1 to 7. I do believe that uh, because of the scriptural evidence. I can't prove the cloud. I wasn't there. But if I look at Brother Bram's ministry preaching, thus saith the Lord, with doctrine and pointing us directly to the Bible and the Bible doesn't contradict himself. I believe that was a, and that's that's what I use. I use the Bible, Brother Bram's ministry and his, his Bible based teachings. And I say, well, because of that, the mysteries have been fulfilled. Then I, I just choose to believe the cloud. I, I believe that God fulfilled Revelation 10, 1 to 7. Jesse, is Jay there? I think we're supposed to oh. go to question three. Yeah, my apologies. I, I just I didn't realize I was actually on mute there. Um, so, yeah, we're going to go into question three from Pastor Smith. Um, Brother Smith, whenever you are ready, you are good to go. OK, uh, question three, I said uh, from your podcast with Abdu Murray regarding the Trinity, he suggested God has three minds, one for each person of the Trinity. And you never objected, Rod. So. I was just wondering, do you believe God has three separate minds uh, and which scriptures explicitly teach he has three minds and literally says he's three persons? Uh, and then, Rod, you have five minutes. Yeah, I think maybe you misunderstood the discussion that Abdu and I had regarding the issue of perichoresis as it relates to the doctrine of the Trinity. First, um, let me state that William Branham used a straw man argument when he talked about the doctrine of the Trinity. That is, he distorted and incorrectly portrayed the doctrine of the Trinity and then attacked the very distortion he created. Are there three minds? Not in the way William Branham distorted things and you're trying to get me to say. So I indicated, I think you misinterpreted what we said. We have to take everything back to scripture. Paul refers to the mind of the spirit in Romans 8.27 refers to the mind of Christ in 1 Corinthians 2.16. Uh, the English Puritan Richard Baxter, who spent time in, in prison for his faith, 
um, said this, to say that the persons in the Trinity are three minds or spirits or substances where each is conscious is to say there are three gods, which he didn't believe. Therefore, the word person as used in respect to the Trinity is a very different signification from the word applied to man. Let me read you Philippians 2, 5 to 7. You should have the same attitude toward one another that Jesus Christ had, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men, and by sharing in human nature. This passage teaches that Jesus Christ became a real human because he did not cling to his divinity. He was willing to empty himself in order to, to take upon himself the form of a slave and be born in human likeness. So what did Jesus empty himself of? Well, Scripture is clear that God knows all things. You can read Psalm 139, 1 John 3.20. It is also clear that Jesus did not know all things, even though he was fully God. Jesus admitted that he did not know the day or the hour of his return. Only the Father knew that. Uh, that's in Matthew 24, 36 and, and Mark 13, 32. Jesus actually said there was something that he, the Son, didn't know. Wasn't he God? Isn't God omniscient, knowing everything? If so, how could there be anything at all that Jesus didn't know? In the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed that the Father would find a way for him to avoid his crucifixion if it was possible. But Jesus could not have sincerely prayed this prayer if he, as God, knew all the way along that it was not possible to avoid the crucifixion. So it seems clear, therefore, that as a full human being, Jesus was not omniscient. He had a finite man, and this is an essential part of what it means to be human. Jesus had to learn and grow in wisdom, just as all other humans do. We read that in Luke 2.52. Indeed, Scripture says that Jesus made God, that God made Jesus perfect through sufferings. He learned obedience through what he suffered. But it was only after he had been made perfect that he be, could become the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. We read that in Hebrews 5. If Jesus was God and was omniscient, that is, he knew everything, how could he learn obedience? Only through the doctrine of the Trinity can you explain how Jesus could have been tempted, just as we are in every respect, even though Scripture also states that God cannot be tempted. So, in conclusion, I believe what the church has always believed. To quote John Calvin, I could wish that they... A number of words to describe the Trinity, such as persons, were buried. If only among all men this faith were agreed on, that the Father and Son and Spirit are one God. Yet the Son is not the Father and the Spirit the Son, but they are differentiated by a peculiar quality. I do not believe in three gods, as you think the doctor of the Trinity teaches. It doesn't. The concept of a person in the doctrine of the Trinity is not the same as a human person, but is simply a word that is used to describe that the Father and Son and Spirit are one God, yet the Son is not the Father, nor the Spirit the Son, but they are differentiated by a peculiar quality. How do you describe a being that exists outside time and space? You want to be able to describe him in terms that a, comp a human can completely comprehend? It's just not possible. According to Augustine, Anyone who denies the Trinity is in danger of losing their salvation, but anyone who tries to understand the Trinity is in danger of losing their mind. I should add that the Sabellian heresy, which the church rejected well before the Nicene Council, and which William Branham taught, is still heresy today. It is also of some consequence that none of the giants of the faith have believed something other than than the doctrine of the Trinity. Go back the last 500 years, find a giant of the faith prior to 1900, say, that believed something out of the Trinity. They didn't. The church has always taught the doctrine of the Trinity. That was actually perfect timing. The thing just went off. So, um, Pastor Smith, you have three minutes to respond. Okay, so um, from Rod's reply, I didn't hear any scripture for three minds um, I did hear the one about the mind of the spirit. So I, I agree with that. The spirit has a mind, but the spirit mind of the spirit has to be the mind of the father. They can't be two separate spirits. They can't be two persons. And Rod, I know you don't believe in three gods, but that's, that's essentially what the doctrine teaches because it says the father is not the Holy spirit. It, there are not, they're, they're not two separate persons. They're one in the same. Uh, because Jesus was conceived of the Holy Ghost. 
and yet he prayed to the father. So he can't have, he can't have two different fathers. So uh, we know you don't say that, but that's, that's the air of the creed. That's why creeds and dogmas, they always add to the word. And, and many people will die the death for three persons and Paul never wrote it. Uh, in fact, it was lost. The, the revelation of God as one person uh, was lost and Jesus prophesied of it. Uh, Jesus told the parable uh, of the woman injecting three measures uh, of leaven into the bread. Well, that was the beginning. That was the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, uh, false trinity doctrine injected at the beginning, towards the beginning of the church age and look through the Catholic Church and look what it's produced. Uh, priests that are pedophiles and uh, it, it's, it's just awful situation. It, it's, it doesn't even uh, resemble real Christianity. And again, I'm not, I'm not blasting the individuals. I pray for people to come out of that. It's the system. It's the awful false doctrine that people get tied into. But I just want to say that Paul never taught three persons. So we cannot add to the word of God. I do believe Jesus had a human mind. So there, God has a mind, but then Jesus as a human had a mind. And I agree. It didn't know all things. Uh, but it's wrong to add to the word. And uh, I forget which creed it was, whether Athanasian or the other one. Uh, when they say the spirit is not the father, they one err. Minute. That what, One minute. Yes, sir. Okay. When they say the spirit is not the father, and it's on all their, it's on all their creeds, and it's on all their, I've seen them. Uh, I'm writing a book on that. Um, when they say that, they automatically contradict the word of God, and they change the word of God. But as Brother Branham said, he said, thus saith the Lord, it's of the devil. He said, but the people can still be saved. They've just changed the doctrine about God. God never wanted to be known as three persons or else he would have wrote it in his word. He, he, he didn't reveal himself that way. He's invisible. The Bible says we'll never see the father. But Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. All right. Thank you. And then, Rod, you have another three minutes. So the best description of the Trinity... I've found is that of C.S. Lewis, who stated this, you know that in space you can move in three ways, to the left or right, backwards or forwards, up and down. Every direction is either one of these three or a compromise between them. They are called the three dimensions. Now notice this, if you're only using one dimension, you could draw only a straight line. If you're using two, you could draw a figure, say a square, and a square is made up of four straight lines. Now a step further, if you have three dimensions, you can then build what we call a solid body, say a cube, a thing like a dice or a lump of sugar, and a cube is made of six squares. Do you see the point? A world of one dimension could be a straight line. In a two-dimensional world, you still get straight lines, but many lines make one figure. In a three-dimensional world, you still get figures, but many figures make one solid body. In other words, as you advance to more real and more complicated levels, you do not leave behind you the things you found on simpler levels. You still have them, but combined in new ways, in ways you could not imagine if you knew only simpler levels. Now, the Christian account of God involves just the same principle. The human level is a simple and rather empty level. On the human level, one person is one being, and any two persons are two separate beings. Just as in two dimensions, say on a flat sheet of paper, one square is one figure, and any two squares are two separate figures. On the divine level, you still find personalities, but up there you find them combined in new ways, which we, who do not live on that level, cannot imagine. In God's dimension, so to speak, you find a being who is three persons, while remaining one being, just as a cube is six squares while remaining one cube. Of course, we cannot fully conceive a being like that, just as if we were so made that we perceived, perceived only two dimensions in space, we could never properly imagine a cube. But we can sort of get a faint notion of it. And when we do, we are then, for the first time in our lives, getting some positive idea, however faint, of something super personal, something more than a person. It is something we could never have guessed, and yet once we have been told, one almost feels one ought to be able to guess it, because it fits so well with all the things we already know. When I contemplate God, I'm like, when I contemplate God, I'm like a square looking at a cube. I'm saying, okay, I get it. A cube is just six squares. But since I do not comprehend a third dimension, I don't really understand a cube. A cube is a single entity, but to a square who only understands two dimensions, he can only understand it by comparing it to his inadequate understanding. He cannot really comprehend a third dimension. 
There is nothing that exists in this universe that compares to God, a being who exists outside of time and space. So I would ask you again, Jesse, one simple question. Can you point out to me one giant of the faith in the past 500 years who did not believe the doctrine of the Trinity? All right. And then, um, so I'm going to leave this up to you guys. Um, we can either do one more three minute back and forth for each or go to Rod's fourth question. Well, let Jesse answer my question. I think it's his, I think he, he, he's should have the turn to do that. Cause okay. I was just asking my follow up. So he should have three minutes to, to answer. Okay. And then it was Jesse's question. So, um, after that, we'll give you a, a three minutes for that as well. Um, because it was a discussion on the on the um, Trinity. So, uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Brother Jesse. The floor is yours. Yeah, as far as giants of the faith, the last 500 years, Rod, no, I don't know anyone um, that believed God was one person. And that's okay. It's not required for salvation. Uh, salvation is a totally different doctrine, saved by grace through faith uh, in the blood of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Calvary. But all the Bible writers, and including Jesus, uh, never taught God was three persons. And that's the most important thing because the gospel started out pure. The word of God is pure. So even Jesus said, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Strict monotheism, not three persons, was always taught by Jesus Christ, by Paul, by John, Peter, James, you name all the New Testament writers. No one ever injected that thought. And this is the thing I just, I really pray for Trinitarians. The Bible said, add not unto his words, lest thou be found a liar. Uh, God does not, God never asked to be known as three persons. So I just plead with people. I pray for them. God, please show them uh, that they're wrong. They, they shouldn't add to the word of God. Uh, is it a mystery? Yes. The mystery is between the father and the son. We know the father is the Holy Spirit. So that, that's not mysterious. The father is the Holy Spirit. That's not mysterious at all. What's mysterious is the oneness between the Father and the Son. But we never, ever want to inject a, a, a false idea or our own man-made understanding into the Scripture. And that's why I love, I, that's why I just love the Bible, because I can just point to the Bible and everything the Bible says about God, I believe it. Because the Bible never says he's three persons or two persons. Uh, the Bible said in Hebrews 1, 3, Jesus Christ is the image of his person one person. And so I thank God for that. And uh, I just hope people's eyes can be open to see that God is not three persons. He never asked to be identified that way. He's one person who reveals himself. So we thank the Lord for that. Hey, I just wanted to add, CJ, if, you, if you'll give me a moment. And again, I know I'm not supposed to participate, but I'm going to participate. One of the things that um, what I'm hearing is Pastor Smith recognizes that Rod doesn't accept the Trinity as three different persons. Is that what I understood, Pastor Smith? Is that did you? Because I think there was a clarification. I wanted to be. I wanted to make sure we understood. Rod doesn't support the idea that there are three separate entities that are the Trinity. So I wanted to make sure you understood that, right? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I must have missed that. I was. I was probably writing down. You know, one of his That's questions. Okay. That's right. That's I'm right. Sorry. So, so here's what, and I want to take this just a moment further. I, you know, Rod talks about the uh, uh, C.S. Lewis, and and that was new to me until here just recently, that sort of interpretation. But I want to talk about this for a moment as my understanding. And again, I'm not very bright, so you'll have to bear with me. One of the things that uh, what I understand is, and I listened to your qualifications or your introduction when we started this process. You are the father of eight. Is that right? Yes, sir. That's a lot of kids, by the way. I, I came from a a family of seven kids, so I'm fully, I, I get it. I totally understand that. You're also a pastor of a church, right? Yes, sir. And you're a public school teacher. Yes, sir. You were somebody's son. You mentioned that your father was healed or that your mother was healed. Rather. My mother, yeah, my father prayed for my mother and she was of cancer. Wow. Okay. So, so you, Jesse Smith, have taken on the role of son, husband, father, right? Teacher, pastor, right? You, singular, you, Jesse Smith, take on these roles. And there are lots of different roles that you take on. Similarly, I think, and this is what I understand from the Lewis thing, although I can't get my mind around uh, the dimensionality, if you will, of God, because I don't think anybody really can. And I agree with you, the Bible is great at this. But from my just 
simple interpretation. I can be a husband, a dad, uh, I can be a, a father, I can be a son, I can be a, you know, I, I can be a process analyst, I can be a, you know, an ordained minister. I get to be all of those things or I get to have all of those attributes and still be one person. Okay. So yeah. I just wanted to kind of mention that, that I think that's, for those of, that are watching, I think the some of the C.S. Lewis stuff can get a little bit heady. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of bring it down to a really stupid guy's level. And I consider myself the stupid guy. So I'm I'm really in that. Uh, I just well, wanted to kind actually, of make sure. Tim, I think what you just described is modalism. Sorry, Jay. I would think Jesse would say. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Modalism is, I, I, I get it as modalism too. But my, my understanding is that you know, we have that God takes on different roles and dimensions that that we can't get our minds around, I guess, is my point. So. But, you know, here's the thing with William Branham. He actually there's a quote. Um, this is from I don't know when it's from. Well, Jesus, he said when Jesus died, the spirit left him in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had to die of a man. And I just go, well, hold on a second. How can he not be God? He said if he'd went up there as God, he'd never died that kind of death. No, no, he did. He was on the cross as God. God died on the cross. Jesus Christ was God in flesh. He died on the cross. What William Branham said, confused. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. So anyway, I'll, I'll back out again. I just wanted to make the 